the General Motors Foundation Engines and Automotive Research Labs on the UT campus, and the UT Site Director for the National Science Foundation's Industry University Cooperative Research Center for Efficient Vehicles and Sustainable Transportation Systems. And most importantly, I am the faculty advisor for the University of Texas at Austin student branch of the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about the formative years of Formula SAE. I'll mostly emphasize the first four years when uh, we founded and hosted Formula SAE here at uh, UT Austin. Uh, but I'll also expand out into uh, the first decade or so of Formula SAE and even a bit uh, beyond that. Uh, Chris Penny of Simmons is going to uh, take over for about the last half hour and uh, we'll see what uh, he's going to talk about when I get to a subsequent uh, slide. Okay, so what none of the teams had in those early years, 1980 through 84, so again, start designing your car in 1980 for the 1981 competition. So there was no internet. Uh, internet went public in 1991. Uh, PCs, the Apple II came out in 1977. The IBM PC came out in 1981. Uh, but neither were widely available for a while. Um, cell phones were demonstrated in 1973 and finally made it to market in 1983, but they cost $3,500. Uh, engineering tools to help design or develop the race cars, uh, computer-aided design and simulation software. Uh, so we didn't have MathForks, uh, MATLAB, and Simulink for modeling and simulating various dynamic systems. Uh, Altair didn't exist, uh, and so they uh, have HyperWorks and computer-aided engineering analysis and optimization software. Uh, didn't have solid modeling and finite uh, element analysis programs such as SolidWorks and uh, Altair. Didn't have aerodynamics modeling uh, programs, uh, CFD programs, uh, <clears throat> computational fluid dynamics programs such as uh, Siemens Star CCM uh, Plus Sim. Uh, <clears throat> didn't have uh, engine intake and or exhaust tuning programs such as Ricardo Wave and uh, some Siemens software that I believe Chris will be talking about a little later. Uh, didn't have intake restrictor optimization programs uh, such as more Siemens software. Didn't have suspension design programs such as more Siemens software. <clears throat> uh, and didn't have race engine simulation programs such as VI Grades, VI Motorsport, and Siemens Simpson, uh, Sim Center, AME Sim. <clears throat> uh, then engineering tools to fabricate the race cars. Did not have uh, MIG welders. <clears throat> uh, so Lincoln Electric produced and sold the first commercial MIG welder in 1994. Uh, for computer-aided manufacturing, didn't have CNC, so we had NC machines in the 1970s. Uh, we didn't have CNC uh, at reasonable cost until the 1980s. Uh, plasma cutting was invented in 1957, but not generally accepted until the mid-70s and did not grow in popularity, uh, in popularity until the mid-80s uh, when low amp systems uh, <clears throat> began to be manufactured. So CNC became available in the late 1980s. Abrasive water jet cutting, uh, we didn't have that. It was patented in 1987 and, and it was available uh, as a CNC machine in the 1990s. Didn't have rapid prototyping or additive manufacturing until 1992. Didn't have aftermarket user programmable uh, engine control uh, modules, modules or <clears throat> onboard computers. Uh, there was almost no commercially available uh, parts. There were almost no commercially available parts for Formula SAE size race cars. And there were no fuel injectors appropriate for Formula SAE size swept volume. So the first fuel injected motorcycle was the 1980 Kawasaki Z1000 Z1 Classic, which is a 1000cc four stroke. Uh, but it uh, didn't comply with the rules for Formula SAE over the first four years. Uh, and so those fuel injectors were too big for uh, uh, 
engines that did fit Formula SA rules. So background on Formula SA. So <clears throat> in 1973 and 1974, there was a competition called the Recreational Ecological Vehicle Competition. It was conceived by Dr. William R. Shapton of the University of Cincinnati. In 1976 was the first mini Baja, now Baja SAE, uh, following up on the uh, branding that I came up with as the name for Formula C. That was, for, uh, Mini Baja was conceived by Dr. John Stevens and first held at the University of South Carolina. All entries had used the stock, unmodified eight, eight horsepower Briggs and Stratton single cylinder engine, and I believe that, that is still a rule today. In 1979, there was the first and only Mini Indy. It was conceived and hosted by Dr. Kurt Marshak at the University of Houston, and all entries had to use a stock unmodified five horsepower Briggs and Stratton single cylinder engine, but it was asphalt racing. <clears throat> so in January of 1980, I joined the mechanical engineering faculty at UT Austin, and almost immediately start, uh, founded the UT student branch of the SAE. <clears throat> Uh, and so when the members of the new UTSA uh, student branch learned that many Indy had died, uh, so <clears throat> Dr. Marshak decided he wasn't going to do it again. Uh, <clears throat> so they uh, generated the concept for a new intercollegiate student engineering uh, design competition based on asphalt racing. Well, my students really wanted to go asphalt racing. So the UT, uh, so UT student SAE uh, uh, branch members, Robert Edwards and John Tilkamp, uh, led a discussion among UT SAE members and envisioned a competition that would involve designing and constructing a race car along the lines of the Sports Car Club of America Formula 440 entry-level racing series that was popular at the time. I came up with the Formula SAE name. <clears throat> Uh, following the format of Formula A and more Formula V, but emphasizing that this new race <coughs> car was an engineering competition rather than a driver's competition. Uh, so Edwards Hellcamp and fellow UTSA students Joe Green, Dick Morton, Mike Best, and Carl Morris drafted a set of safety and competition rules and presented them to the SA student branch membership and to me, I then contacted Bob Seckler, who at the time was the head of SA Educational Relations, uh, the ed SA Educational Relations Department at SA headquarters, and later became uh, the head of <clears throat> intercollegiate competitions uh, for SAE. Uh, and I asked him uh, for his permission both to establish uh, this new intercollegiate student engineering design competition and to host the first Formula SA competition during the summer of 1981, and Bob uh, agreed. So then uh, UT stu uh, SA student branch officers Mike Best, Carl Morris, and Sylvia Obergon, along with me, began planning and organizing the event to be held in May 1981. Here it's important to note that Formula SA was not a simple renaming of the mini Indy competition, but was instead an entirely new intercollegiate student engineering design competition. So unlike all previous SAE sanctioned student racing and design competitions, including mini Indy, the Formula SA rules left the selection of the engine to the design team. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll discuss uh, the rules in a, in a subsequent slide. Also, unlike all previous SA sanctioned student racing and design competitions, including many in the uh, mini in the uh, engine modifications were not only allowed, but they were encouraged. <clears throat> okay, so the UTSA students, uh, once they decided that we were gonna have this uh, new intercollegiate student engineering design competition, had to send letters to uh, engineering schools across the US to attract entrants. Uh, to that first competition because there was no internet, there was no email, so uh, snail mail was uh, our <clears throat> only option. Okay, so the rules for the very first Formula C, the vehicle must be able to carry a person six feet tall, weighing 200 pounds. There was cost ceiling of uh, $1,750. Uh, brakes had to be capable of sliding two tires on dry pavement or of stopping the vehicle within 25 feet from an initial speed of 20 miles per hour. 
Uh, vehicle must be of student design and construction. The design team could select any four-stroke single carburetor engine with an intake port restriction of one inch. Okay, so <clears throat> this is essentially uh, uh, similar to the intake restrictor or having a single intake restrictor uh, with a diameter of 25.4 millimeters. If you have a four-stroke, four-cylinder engine and you have uh, four intake strokes in a row, and so you're only breathing through uh, uh, one intake port at a time, and there is some overlap in the uh, <clears throat> uh, intake valve uh, timing. So uh, one intake valve will be closing while, the, uh, while another cylinder will have an intake valve opening. Uh, and so there is some overlap, but uh, the open areas for both added together are still much less than this uh, one inch intake port restriction. So there are also some safety rules in year one, such as a requirement for a roll bar and a driver's helmet, but unfortunately those rules were typewritten, duplicated, and handed out to the judges, including the original, and uh, there are no remaining copies, so we're not certain what uh, all of the remaining rules were in that first year. So there were three events in 1981. There was a 100 yard drag race from a standing start. There was a fuel economy event and there was a combined maneuverability and endurance event uh, and each counted equally. Uh, there were no static events, but there were two awards. There was an award for best appearance, which uh, I'm proud to say that uh, my team's car won. And there was also an award for excellence in engineering design and creativity, which again, our car won. Uh, because we used a 300cc Wankel engine, that's a four-stroke engine, uh, and we also used a variable sheet belt drive uh, rather than a transmission. Okay, so I'd like to give uh, uh, a lot of credit to uh, the judges, uh, because without judges, then uh, you really can't have one of these uh, student competitions. So one of them was Malcolm Abel. He was a graduate of uh, UT's mechanical engineering department. And after he graduated, he went to Midland, Texas and started a successful oil company. Uh, Dr. Fred Buckingham of Forney Engineering in Addison, Texas, uh, was a judge all four years. So the judges uh, whose names are underlined were judges all four years that we hosted it here at UT. And some of those also went on uh, to be judges in <clears throat> at some of the subsequent competitions as well. Uh, Jim Hall, so let me say a bit about Jim Hall uh, because a lot of uh, the younger people in the audience uh, may not recognize the name, but Jim Hall uh, grew up in Midland, Texas, as to die, uh, and his father owned an oil company. Uh, Jim went off to Caltech and got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and planned to go out and be a mechanical engineer, of course, but then in, or as soon as he graduated, his father became ill, and so he had to uh, go to Midland and run the oil company. And his dad was a collector of unusual old cars, uh, rare cars like the locomobile. And Jim was interested in cars, but not in those kinds of cars. He was interested in race cars. And so he bought uh, some race cars, learned how to drive, and decided, why am I buying other people's cars? I'm a mechanical engineer. I'll design my own cars. So back in the day, cars were running around on skinny tires, using manual transmissions, no aerodynamics, <clears throat> uh, and uh, steel space frame uh, uh, cars. So Jim Hall came up with uh, using wings to generate downforce, so it could go around corners faster. Uh, he decided that uh, he should have an automatic transmission so that the driver could keep both hands on the steering wheel. Uh, he decided that uh, he should be using fat tires instead of skinny tires. And uh, he also came up with the very first composite uh, body frame combination. And now all race teams are doing those things. Uh, so Jim Hall flew in, uh, flew himself in, in his own uh, private jet uh, with Malcolm Abel uh, at his side. 
uh, from the Indy 500, uh, where he had just uh, finished competing. Uh, Jerry Wallingford was judge all four years, worked for EGNG Automotive Research in San Antonio. Uh, Larry Bindley uh, also worked for EGNG Automotive Research. Uh, Jim Brown uh, worked for Southwest Research Institute in San, in San Antonio. Uh, Southwest Research Institute is the largest independent automotive R&D facility in the uh, US, uh, although they branched out and uh, do research in a lot of other areas as well now. Uh, and uh, Sam Ide from Ford was also a judge all four years. He was with uh, Advanced Engines at Ford. Uh, Clark Kibler of Mobile Oil. <clears throat> so Clark was a forensic engineer for Mobile Oil back before there was an Exxon Mobil, and in fact, back when Exxon was still Esso. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, Clark, Clark's job was uh, for any race car that had a problem that they thought was lubricant related, uh, Clark would go uh, do forensic engineering on that car and whether uh, uh, it ended up being a lubrication related product, uh, problem or not, and whether or not it was a mobile product or not. Uh, Clark would figure out what was the uh, problem and recommend the solution. Uh, and Clark was a good all four years. Uh, Tim Harrington from the General Motors Assembly Division in Oklahoma City was a judge, uh, Jim Medley. Uh, from the General Motors Assembly Division in Arlington, Texas, uh, was also a judge at first year. And Jim Gray was a judge all four years. He was with eg and Automotive Research. And unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of Jim. Okay, come on. All right. So the UT team had to, uh, not only design and fabricate a race car in that first year, but also had to acquire used tires set for race courses. And so uh, their plates were extremely full at the time. Okay, uh, so the first competition was held in the parking lot at the UT Baseball Stadium, May 29th and 30th uh, of 1991. And so here's uh, some photographs of some of the cars in action. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so this uh, competition was held a few days after the famous Memorial Day flood, but uh, it was still occasionally uh, <clears throat> raining very hard, and so there was a downpour. Uh, and our team had no money. I don't think any of the teams had any money back then. Uh, but somebody gave us some sheet titanium, which is what our front spoiler was made out of, and we got it for free. Uh, but then running on slicks on all four corners on a wet track, uh, uh, our titanium spoiler ended up biting the dust. And we also ended up uh, shearing a half shaft. So that may explain why we came in last, although I prefer to think of us as coming in in the bottom 25%. Uh, Stephen Institute of Technology, uh, when both the acceleration and maneuverability endurance events, they came in first place. Uh, notice they are from New Jersey. Uh, second place, University of Cincinnati, they won a fuel economy event uh, with getting almost 85 miles per gallon. Uh, and so that's Ohio. <clears throat> and then the University of Tulsa from Oklahoma came in third. And then uh, the host school came in in the bottom 25%. Uh, there were a couple of other schools who said they would attend that first event, uh, but uh, didn't show. But nevertheless, it was a national event. Uh, teams from uh, New Jersey, Ohio, Oklahoma, and Texas. Okay, then in 1982, uh, to attract more teams, we, we did three things. One, we said that a car could be entered two years uh, as long as it met the rules each year. We said that many Baja cars could be entered in uh, the BNS class as long as they met the uh, 
the 82 rules. Uh, and then the formal essay uh, entrance train in the SAE class. And then each school could enter two cars. So those changes resulted in nine entrants in 1982. So that was up from the four in the previous year. So that was good. Uh, there were four cars in the SAE class and a bunch of cars in the SAE class. Uh, it said they would show up, but were no shows. And we had five cars in the BNS class. <clears throat> So we got uh, timing equipment and pylons from Texas Spokes Sports Car Club. Okay, so the rules for the 82 competition were based on those for the 81 event as modified in compliance with suggestions from the judges. So again, any four stroke single carburetor engine could be used, the intake port orifice was limited to one inch in diameter again. Uh, so a new rule, mufflers were required. Our uh, car the previous year was extremely loud. Uh, <clears throat> so beyond those restrictions, any modifications are allowed and encouraged again. Uh, however, all modifications had to be performed by students again. Uh, we have a range of fuels that the students, uh, <clears throat> student teams could choose from. Four wheel suspensions required for all entries in the SAE class and uh, the same rule about the uh, uh, vehicle must be capable of uh, carrying a driver six feet tall and weighing 200 pounds. And then uh, we have some additional uh, rules shown on this page and I won't go through them. Uh, but our total project cost was up to $2,000 as verifiable by receipts. In the case of donated parts, reasonable estimate, the value was acceptable. And so again, I'm not gonna bother going through all the rules, but uh, you will have access to this presentation later if you are interested. And there are also a couple of SAE papers that are referenced at the end of this, where you can go and uh, uh, find out what these rules were in 82 and also 83 and 84. So again, uh, our events, we had the same three events, uh, 100 yard drag race from a standing start. Uh, fuel economy was 20 laps, totaling about four miles. Uh, entrants provided their own fuel. Uh, measured amount of fuel was added by the uh, race officials. All those cars ran on the track at the same time. And then the maneuverability and endurance race was a rigorous pave, slightly rolling, uh, 1,476 foot. Uh, course, foot long course, all entries in each class ran on the course at one time for a total of about 14 miles. And the race consisted of two heats of 50 laps each with a mandatory five minute driver change period after 25 laps. Uh, and for all performance events, the highest score for two attempts was used and a driver change was mandatory between attempts. And again, there were uh, two awards, the same two awards. Okay, and so these are our 82 judges. And so those in bold are new judges uh, for uh, 1982, D.G. Harris from Kelly Air Force Base, Vance Hunt of the General Motors Assembly Division in Arlington, uh, Paul Miller of K from KVB Consulting Engineers in Houston, and Rudy Shomo, uh, from Union Carbide in Port Lavac, Texas. Okay, 1982, second year for Formula SAE, it became an international event. Uh, Universidad de Sol from Mexico City uh, ran in the uh, BNS class and they won a special sportsmanship award. And they had a hard time getting through the technical inspection. And so some of the other teams, maybe all of the other teams, pitched in to help uh, LaSalle get through the tech inspection. And some members from uh, my team went to the UT uh, Mechanical Engineering Machine Shop and fabricated some parts for them. Uh, Nickel State uh, from Louisiana, I ran in the SAE class. Southern Methodist University uh, uh, ran in the BNS class. The University of Houston ran in the SAE class. University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I ran in the SAE class. 
uh, University of Texas at Arlington and brought two cars, both of which ran in the BNS class. And then uh, <clears throat> we had a, uh, a new car uh, that we entered in the SAE class, and we also entered a car in the BNS class. Okay, let's see. I'll just leave it like this. Okay, so it was held in a student parking lot at UT May 27th to 29th. Uh, and this just simply shows some of the cars in action. Okay, so there were trophies given for first and second place in each class. <clears throat> and these are the results uh, from uh, all of the events. Uh, UT, our, our number one car came in first, uh, winning uh, the acceleration event and the maneuverability endurance event. Uh, University of Illinois uh, came in second, and they won the fuel economy event. In the BNS class, uh, UT Arlington number one car won the acceleration event and the fuel economy event. Uh, and that car came in second, and their number two car won the uh, maneuverability endurance event and uh, <clears throat> came in in first place uh, in the BNS class. There was no overall trophy, but everybody in the SA class was surprised at how well the uh, Baja uh, or BNS class cars ran, the mini Baja cars that uh, ran in a separate class. Okay, for 1983, the BNS class was discontinued, but each school was still allowed to enter two cars. Nevertheless, there were 11 entrants from nine universities in 1983, so grew a little bit more in uh, 1983. Okay, come on. All right, this thing is not cooperating for me. There you go. Okay, so the rules for the 83 uh, competition, again, were based on the 82 event as modified in compliance with suggestions from the judges. Uh, okay, and so things that are different uh, are highlighted, highlighted in red, and we're not going to go through. Uh, these rules for the sake of brevity. Uh, you can see that mirrors were allowed, limited one gallon of fuel. Oop. Okay, so we <clears throat> had the same three events again uh, and the same two uh, awards. Uh, so the fuel economy event was 20 laps totaling almost five miles in length. Uh, and maneuverability and endurance, uh, about a 1740 foot long course, all entries in each class run on course at one time uh, for a total of uh, about 13 miles. And they consist of two heats, 40 laps with mandatory five minute driver change after 20 laps. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> Jim Brown was our race director in 1983, uh, and new judges were Randy Betke from Ford Motor Company uh, in electrical engineering uh, at, uh, uh, in Dearborn, and Robert Natkin, uh, also from Ford, was new judge, and he was also with Advanced Engines, uh, as is Sam, I Sam Idy, uh, judge number three there. Okay, so only a couple of new judges in 1983. Okay, so uh, Universidad La Salle entered again, uh, but they uh, did not start because they broke their front suspension at Marquette University from Wisconsin, uh, Michigan Tech uh, from Michigan, of course. Nichols State entered again, uh, and again, they're from Louisiana. Texas A&M entered for the first time uh, obviously from Texas. Uh, University of Houston entered again. Uh, UT Arlington uh, entered uh, two cars. And uh, we entered a new car. 
Uh, and we brought our uh, uh, first, we entered our first uh, composite car uh, in uh, Formula SAE, but it did not start due to a transmission failure and West Virginia also entered that year. Okay, so it's again held in a student parking lot. Uh, and here's some uh, pictures of uh, cars in competition. And now there were uh, trophies for first, second, and third place. Um, so uh, UT Arlington's number one car came in first. They uh, won the fuel economy event and won the maneuverability and endurance event. Uh, and the maneuverability and endurance event counted twice as many points as the other events. So they got 260 points. Uh, University of Houston came in second. And even though they didn't win any of the events, uh, I came in with 160 points. Uh, Marquette University won the uh, drag race, uh, but DNS and the maneuverability and endurance event. And then uh, UT Arlington's number two car came in in third place and again didn't win any events, but did. Uh, uh, compete in all three events. <clears throat> okay, so in 1984, <clears throat> uh, each school was still allowed to enter two cars. There were eight entrants from seven universities, so we went down uh, by uh, <clears throat> one entrant in uh, 1984 compared to 1983. So there were three entrants from three universities that said they uh, would attend but failed to show up or uh, we would have gone up instead of down uh, in number of entrants. Uh, the maneuverability and endurance race was an uh, event that was a single event up until our final year uh, at UT, and that was split into two events. Uh, the endurance race counted twice as many points as any other event as it did the previous year. Um, and the award for excellence in engineering and design creativity required the student team to give a 10 to 15 minute technical presentation to the judges discussing the engineering aspects of the uh, design of the vehicle. Okay, so uh, fuel rules changes. Uh, so <clears throat> any four stroke single carburetor engine could be used as in all three previous years. But now the exit bore of the carburetor casting uh, could not exceed 25.4 millimeters for a butterfly type carb or 34 millimeters for a slide valve carb. Turbocharging, supercharging, and nitrous oxide injection were allowed uh, because that required additional engineering. The roll bar must clear the top of the driver's helmet by at least a half inch, and drivers may not lean outside of the roll bar during the race. All vehicles had to have four wheel independent suspension and must have a wheelbase of 65 to 100 inches. The vehicle must have a ground clearance of no more than six inches, six inches without a driver. All vehicles had to have a body that resembles a Formula car. No body, no body panels could be removed for the race unless the judges decide that such panels should be removed for the sake of safety. And then total project cost, excluding student labor, must not exceed $2,000 again. Uh, but the necessary cost documentation must be presented to the judges on Thursday evening uh, during the tech inspection. Okay, so again, had acceleration, still a uh, hundred yards from a standing start. Fuel economy event was 15 laps, totaling about five miles in length. Uh, all the cars ran on track at the same time. The endurance race was held on a, uh, <clears throat> Uh, paved, slightly rolling uh, course, 1,060 feet in length. All entries ran on the course at one time, as usual, for a total of approximately 14 miles, uh, two heats of 20 laps, I'm sorry, of 70 laps each with mandatory five minute driver change period after 35 laps. And then the maneuverability of uh, race was run on the same course as the endurance race, but for only two laps from a flying start and with only one vehicle on the track at a time. 
three attempts were allowed for each vehicle. Any car that left track was required to re-enter there at the same point at which it exited. Okay, so for each vehicle in each event, scoring was based on the lowest lapse time or the lowest fuel consumption recorded from the allowable attempts. Points were then awarded based on a linear scale for each event, so this was new. Uh, lowest lapse time or fuel volume use received 100 points, and the fifth best lapse time or fuel volume use received 20 points, and then there was linear scale in between. Okay, and again, there were uh, two awards, uh, best appearance and excellence in engineering design and creativity. Okay, so here's our judges. And again, the judges in bold were new, Mike Barrett from IBM in Austin, Mike Best from EGNG Automotive Research in San Antonio, Robert Cumberford from Cumberford Motors in Austin. And he's written uh, a book uh, on the history of cars. Uh, Jerry Milbauer from Cadillac in Detroit, Dick Morton from Tracor uh, here in Austin. Uh, Jerry Wallingford was the race director uh, in 1984, and uh, Bill Weaver was the new judge from uh, Corvette Design Group in Warren, Michigan. Okay, so uh, Lawrence Institute of Technology uh, in Michigan uh, entered. Uh, Milwaukee School of Engineering in Wisconsin entered, Nickel State entered again, Texas A&M entered again, uh, University of Houston entered again, UT Arlington uh, entered uh, again, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> we entered two cars, uh, and one was our first composite car that did not start the previous year. And so we overcame transmission problems and uh, got it through uh, in its second year of competition. And our number one car was a brand new car. Okay, so it's again held in the student parking lot at UT. And here's uh, some pictures of race cars in action. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> okay. So we gave uh, trophies for fourth through fifth places. And let's see. So uh, University of Houston won uh, overall. And they came in first place. They won the fuel economy event. They won the drag race uh, and uh, finished both maneuverability and endurance. Uh, the second place went to Texas A&M, and they didn't uh, win any of the events, but still managed to amass a lot of points. Uh, and let's see, <clears throat> UT Arlington came in in third place, and they won the maneuverability event, and they won the endurance event. And uh, UT's number one car came in in fourth place, uh, and didn't win any events, uh, but still managed to amass a significant number of points. And then our number two car uh, came in in fifth place and did not get to the endurance event. Okay, in 1985, <clears throat> the competition was hosted by UT Arlington under SA faculty advisor Bob Woods. Uh, and so the engine displacement was capped at 610 cc's, the restrictor decreased from 25.4 millimeters to 23 millimeters. They replaced the 15 minute presentation, justifying that the car met the $2,000 cost limit with a scored cost event uh, that uh, counted for 100 points, estimating the cost if uh, the car was mass produced at 1,000 a year. Uh, they added two additional static events, the presentation event at 50 points and a design event at 150 points. They added the skid pad event at 50 points. Uh, fuel economy uh, was worth 50 points. It was measured during the maneuverability event, which was worth 150 points. And the endurance score increased to 350 points for a total of a thousand points, they brought in the uh, Sports Car Club of America uh, to help officiate and uh, run the race. And 15 cars entered in that year, in 1985. 
1986. It was hosted by Lawrence Institute of Technology in Southfield, Michigan, under SAE Tech Advisor Wayne Brahov. In 1987, went back to UT Arlington under SAE Faculty Advisor Bob Woods. Uh, and so in 86, there were 15 cars, and in 87, 24 cars. 1988, it went back to Lawrence Institute of Technology under uh, SA Factory Advisor Wayne Grayhop again, 28 entries. 1989, it was co hosted by the SAE South Texas section of S uh, and uh, the professional section, and by UT San Antonio, and there were 36 cars from 31 schools. And in 1990, it was hosted by Lawrence Technological University. Note that that's uh, Lawrence Institute of Technology underwent a name change. Uh, between 1988 and 1990. Uh, and there were 38 entries. Uh, General Motors then hosted the competition in 1991, Ford in 92, Chrysler in 93. And after the 1992 competition, the three formed a consortium to run Formula SE. And at the end of the 2008 competition, the consortium ceased to exist. And most of today's students were too young to remember what happened to the automotive industry in 2008 uh, and uh, early 2009, but serious downturn in the automotive industry and they started selling divisions and uh, <clears throat> finishing uh, or eliminating car lines and doing whatever else they could uh, to try to stay uh, financially viable. And one of the things that had to go was the money they were putting into uh, running the Formula SA consortium. Okay, so this is simply a graph of the number of uh, entrants each year uh, for that first decade. And so you can see that uh, we had this one little downturn here, but uh, for the most part, it's on a uh, significant upward trajectory. Uh, right now, there are more than 650 teams from 50 countries and Formula SAE, two Formula SAE events in the US and Formula SAE events in, as I recall, uh, Japan, Australia, Brazil, uh, Italy, Austria, Germany, and England. So it has become a worldwide competition. Okay, so there are a few references listed here. Uh, but if you're interested, and you can go to some of these references to find the detailed rules for each year, except for 1990, uh, 1981. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, there are lots of Formula SAE related SAE technical papers that you can get uh, by searching the SAE Digital Library, and their website is uh, provided at the bottom of uh, this page. So, uh, are there any questions? Uh, let's see. Okay, well, if there aren't, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Penny from Siemens, and he's going to talk to us about some of the um, <clears throat> tools that are available to uh, the Formula SAE teams from uh, the current time. So, Chris, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, Ron, you can see my screen, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. So my name is uh, Chris Penny. I'm one of the um, uh, one of the uh, people that handle the the academic program um, for for Siemens. Um, actually, let me make one adjustment real quick. Sorry, give me one second. Ron, it looks like um, when I look through the panel, um, it, it appears as though we have to click people to allow to talk. Um, I also see that uh, it looks like people can raise their hands. Okay, do you see any raised hands or chats or anything? I don't 
yet. Um, I, I'll click on you guys if you can hear me right now. Um, you click. I think there's a button that allows you to raise your hand. I'll, I'll click on you to allow you to talk. Um, oh, I see one. Added okay. You. All right, Andrew, can you, um, I think you can talk now. Andrew, are you there? By the way, I, I see that the record button, it, it looks like it, the, the session did not record my, um, my presentation. So for those that are watching the recording right now, um, if you um, if you go to our booth or uh, you can contact me, uh, chris.penny at siemens.com, um, I do have a YouTube video of, of my recording that goes in, in further depth. So uh, just feel free to reach out to me and I can provide that. Um, I don't know if Andrew, I allowed him to talk in the session, but I I don't see him. It looks like it should have sent him to panelist, and I don't see him there. Um, so I guess maybe I'll ask for anybody else. Um, do, does anybody else have any questions? All right. I think everybody's good. Um, thank you, Ron, for the presentation. That, that was very thank interesting. You, All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining um, yes. and uh, yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, I guess, let me know. All right, take care, Ron. Bye everyone. Okay, you too, Chris.